is. Out of all the messages that we're planning on uh, presenting, whether it's the Antichrist, Mark of the Beast, Abomination of Desolation, tomorrow night is the most important. And that's not just trying to get you here. It really, really is the most important. And you'll see clearly as uh, we, uh, when you come back. All right? Uh, let's see, should we cover everything? Sometimes I forget. Okay. All right, I guess that's going to do it. All right. Put your seatbelts on tonight. All right. Uh, tonight is a pretty basic message, but it is very, very helpful in understanding what is actually going on behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, what is happening. And so, uh, anyway, as we open God's Word, what's the first thing we all do? Pray. Pray. Let's make do. Let's bow our heads, please. Our gracious Father, we, we, your children, rebellious by nature, seek for your guidance in our lives that what is going on behind the scenes we can have a better understanding into by your us. So this, not this, this evening, we ask for your spirit once again that you would be lifted up and that you would be glorified. That you would increase and self would decrease. For you alone are worthy to be worshipped. For you alone are God. We thank you for bringing us out this evening and do grace us with thy presence. And in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Cosmic conflict than a cosmic conflict, a great battle between the forces of good and evil. Yeah. Would we all agree? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? Sure. And from the looks of it, it seems as if the evil side is winning. Does it not? Yes. The increase of vice and violence is disturbing. And though we all can clearly see as to what is happening, more importantly, why is this happening? If God is all-powerful, in equally loving, why does he allow all this evil? That's the million dollar question, brothers and sisters. It really is. And by God's grace, we need to look at two important biblical principles. One is responsibility and the other is worship. Which two did we say? Responsibility. Worship. And once we understand the role that responsibility and worship have between these two opposing forces, namely Jesus and Satan, we can, by God's grace, answer the big enchilada. So, with that being said, let's go to the book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Bear the ship in the beginning. Let's go to the book of beginnings. Chapter 1. Should be pretty easy enough. Genesis chapter 1. Here we go. In the beginning, love. In the beginning, love. Form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was what? Good. It was good. Jump down to verse 10, please. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called the seas. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 16, please. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the dead. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from darkness. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to, it, to its kind. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 25. 
And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was? Good. Verse 27. Uh, 20, yeah, 27. So God created male and female. He created them. Verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was? Very good. good. Very good. In the beginning, it was all very, very good. Now, fast forward to our present condition in our world today. Would you describe it as it being very good? No. 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 The brutality and disasters, good would not be a proper fit. Agreed? Agreed. Of course. Now, that doesn't mean there's nothing good in our world because we have some of the best humanitarian programs, some wonderful charities. It's just that when you look at the overall picture, good does not seem to be an accurate description. True? True. True. All right. Now, let's transition over to the first book of the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, and notice a very interesting parallel. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. In the beginning, it was very good. What happened? Matthew 13. First book of old to the first book of the new. Wonder what a parable is? A parable is nothing more but an earthly story to communicate a heavenly message. Nothing more. Jesus uses earthly symbols to communicate a heavenly point to us. Fishermen and, and peasants and farmers. Matthew chapter 13. Let's pick it up in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed, what seed? Good. Good seed in its field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, or weeds, among the wheat, and went his way. The weeds also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow, what seed? Good seed. Good. Good seed in your field. How then does it have tares? Verse 28. He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, while, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let reapers first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into the my barn. Now jump over to verse 37. Jesus is going to explain the parable to us. The good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The what seed? The good seed. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Okay, now notice. When the son of man Jesus goes forth scattering seed. What kind of seed does he plant? Good. 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 After Jesus created. Exactly. What? Remember? Responsibility. responsibility. Okay. Now, with this idea of responsibility in mind, there's five words that identifies the one responsible. Five words that identifies the one responsible for all the weeds in the field is in verse 25. We'll have it up on the board. An enemy has done this. So Jesus, who does he identify the enemy to be in verse 39? Who does he identify the enemy to be in verse 39? The devil. The devil. The devil. The devil is the one responsible for the tares, the weeds, or this wickedness in the world. Let's continue. Notice the board, please. How God anointed Jesus, who went about doing good. There's our word in healing some who were oppressed by the devil. Aww. All who were oppressed. Now, who's the one responsible for causing all this hardship to God's children? The enemy. Devil. The devil is. And who's the one giving relief to those who are oppressed? Who invites us. He doesn't strong arm us. He invites us to come to him who labor in our burden. Of course. You know, it's pretty fascinating that if you ever did a study, people that he did preaching, wherever Jesus walked, whether it was Bethany, Capernaum, Galilee, he, he healed everybody's sickness. His heart of love and compassion was moved to heal all sicknesses. I mean, isn't that a wonderful picture of God? Of course it is. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father. Absolutely. 
Let's continue. Let's go to Luke chapter 13, please. Just a couple of books forward. Luke 13. Let's pick it up in verse 10. Luke 13, verse 10. Now he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the, on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, a sickness, 18 years, and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, anger, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or not this woman whom Satan has bound? Think of it. For 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. Okay, with this idea of responsibility in mind, there's four words who I... Illness. Look at the board. Whom Satan has bound. Now, how much responsibility does Jesus get for this woman's illness? Zero. And who was the one responsible? Satan was. Satan was. Now, this word Satan is actually a transliteration from the Hebrew word Satan, which literally means an enemy. Do you remember when Jesus was questioned about the appearance of the weeds? How did he respond? The enemy. The enemy has done this. Satan, Satan, the devil. All this world's sickness and suffering has its roots and its origin with the enemy. Now, what we find disturbing is that suffering. Now, you may be sitting back there saying, Brother David, we don't blame God. Oh, really? Really? Well, then why is it that when a terrible tragedy hits, you know, we all people see it, oh, God, how could you be doing this to me? Huh? I hear it all the time. You know, when a Category 5 uh, hurricane rips through small town USA, our insurance companies call them acts of God. God. Yeah. Well, was it an act of God that caused that hurricane or cyclone that destroyed the lives of Job's children? No. Who was responsible for causing that whirlwind? Satan. That was Satan, exactly. Yeah, when it's not a destroyer of life, but a restorer. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So, what can we learn about this arch rebel of ours? The saga of a fallen angel. We are going to look at the very beginning of this highly decorated angel and try to find out what went wrong. What happened? Now, unbelievable as this may be, there are some years ago, we were doing a campaign, a seminar just like this in Meriden, Connecticut. And we handed out some material to a lovely woman. And she brought it to her pastor. And she came back and said to us, my pastor said, don't worry about this. There's no such thing. Is this what we do when we have questions? Run to our ministers, or should we run to our master? Brothers and sisters, there is a devil out there. That you can be sure of. And he would be the last one to let you know that, he is, that he's not out there. That's right. It's true. So, what can we know about this fallen angel? Let's take a look. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Here we have two clues regarding... Now, I want you to think about this idea of falling with me. Let's say I'm walking down the street with my friend, and he likes to horse around, okay? And so he sticks his foot out, and he trips me. Who would be responsible for my fall? My friend would be, obviously, sure. Now, let's say I'm walking down the street by myself, and I trip over my own two feet. Who would be responsible for my fall? Myself. And here, Jesus is implying that the fall of Satan was himself. He, well, that's right, I saw Satan fall. But most, most, what's more remarkable, clue number two, where did he fall from? From heaven. 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 How could that be? How is that possible? Well, what do you say we take a look, okay? Let's go Ezekiel 20. Heaven's a place full of blissfulness and peace and love. What happened? Ezekiel chapter 28. That's just before the book of Daniel. 
Ezekiel chapter 28. Now, briefly, as we read this, okay, what we're going to be reading is about, uh, God is going to be talking about this man called the king of Tyre. But what we will soon discover is that God is not so much speaking about the man king Tyre, but the power working behind this man. For instance, do you remember when Jesus was speaking to his disciples about, about going back to Jerusalem, where he was going to be rejected by his own people? Peter heard that. He stood up and said, far be it from you, Lord. I'll never let that happen. And then Jesus, probably with his, one of his most scathing rebukes, said to Peter, get behind me. Okay, question. Was Jesus speaking directly to Peter or the power working behind him? All right. Notice. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. The man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Was King Tyre ever in the garden of Eden? No. No, but was there an angelic being in the garden of Eden? Yes. Of course. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardas, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The work, his voice box, was prepared for you on the day you were created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You are on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Okay, did you notice what word we just read, what word we read three times in those passages? Three times, what word did we read? Did you pick it up? Did you pick up on it? You. You. you no. Were. No. Wickedness. Perfect. 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 Aided that just like everything else God created, how did it turn out? Perfect. Perfect. Very good. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. Anything that comes from the hand of love is going to be perfect. Moses in Deuteronomy says his work is perfect. David in Psalm 19 says the law, the law of the Lord, God's Ten Commandments is perfect. James chapter 1 says every good and every perfect gift is from above, of course. Of course. Furthermore, this angel was not only created perfect, but how else? I heard it. Beautiful. Beautiful. This was the most beautiful and jelly. And this is very, very important, brothers and sisters, because many in the Christian world have the idea of Satan running around in red leotards with horns and a tail. That's not the enemy. That's not Satan, brothers and sisters, okay? That's not the enemy. Folks, God did not create some hideous creature, but what he did create was a beautiful, angelic being. And you know something? Satan loves nothing more when people envision him as a fiery red demon. Of course. And those who do, those who do, may, may find themselves bowing before the beast at the altar and embracing his mark. Brothers and sisters, if your idea of Satan is running around in a red jumpsuit, please reconsider those ideas. Now verse 14, please. Notice verse 14. You were the anointed cherub who covers... You are the anointed cherub who covers. Now this is very, very important. And to the average reader, it can be over, easily overlooked. But this is what we call sanctuary language. What kind of language? Sanctuary. sanctuary language. And when the prophet Ezekiel was writing this, he figured that those who would be reading it knew exactly what he was talking about. Sanctuary. This is how God lived among his people. God told Moses, make them, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among my people. This was God's plan of restoring, re uh, reconciling the broken relationship with his children. You see, love always takes the initiative of bringing his people back into God's presence. Now, the sanctuary, folks, consisted of three parts representing the plan of salvation, which we will cover in detail in a future night. But for now, we're just going to do it in broad strokes, okay? Right here, you had the place, and then you had the wash basin, also known as the labor. And then when you entered the tent, you had two rooms. 
The first room was called the holy place, where you had the seven branch candlestick, the, uh, the altar of incense, the table of showbread, and then you had this curtain that divided the holy place from the most, most holy, holy place. And in the most holy place, you had only one piece of furniture, which was what? Ark of the, Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, exactly. And what was inside the Ark of the Covenant? Ten God's Ten Commandments. God's perfect law of love and liberty. And right above that law, you had this lid. We call it the mercy seat, but it was known simply as the lid. And we, which represented the very presence of God. And get this, covering that light, that, prince, that presence were two anointed cherubs. Satan was one of these angels. Satan was an anointed cherub who covers. He stood in the immediate presence of God's glory. Folks, to stand right by his side, that's fascinating to contemplate, folks. Fascinating to contemplate. Notice, let's continue. Let's continue. You were on the holy mountain of God. You were on the holy mountain of God. You know, God's abode has always been pictured on a high mountain. In Job chapter 3, God tells, jo God tells Job that you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Mount Zion, my holy mountain. And when God reveals himself, he usually does it on a high mountain. For instance, God revealed himself to Abraham when he offered his son Isaac on Mount Zion. Moriah, Mount Moriah. God revealed himself to Carmel. God revealed himself to the nation of Israel when he thundered his law of love and liberty, the Ten Commandments, on Mount Sinai. New Testament is no different. Jesus was transfigured on an exceeding high, high mountain. Jesus' was ascension into heaven was on the Mount of Olives. And the single greatest demonstration of God's love is Mount Calvary. Yeah, when he, the Father, gave his son for your lawless deeds and my lawless deeds. Anyone ever question the character of God, go to the cross. Go to the cross. Let's continue. You walk back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Walking back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You know, many times God's throne is pictured as it's clear. Well, in Revelation, this sea of glass is mingled with fire. So what do you suppose a throne mingled with fire might look like? <coughs> Probably fiery stones. So picture it. Well, here we have this beautiful, perfect angel dwelling in the very presence of God, walking back and forth on the throne of God, dwelling on the mountain of God. What happened? What happened? War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the new part of the whole world? Amen. Are you deceived? Oh, yes. You know, folks, there's only one way to deceive somebody, and that's what? You must what? Lie. You must what? Lie. You must lie. So if, get this now, very important. If Satan's deceiving the world, the world must be embracing his what? Lie. And if the world is embracing Satan's lie, they must be rejecting God's truth. Chapter 4. The spirit of deception and the spirit of truth. Lie and be lost. Question. Do you prefer the truth? Then you need to come back next week for the world's greatest religious cover-up. You need to come back next week for the world's greatest religious cover-up. But notice, though, let's continue. War broke out where, folks? You know, if it said war broke out in the Middle East, that wouldn't surprise us now, would it? But war in heaven, that's unthinkable. Now, what's the first images that come to your mind when you think of war? Bloodshed. 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 What else? Apache helicopters, armored battleships. The Greek is polemio. Polemio. It's where we get our English word polemics. Does anybody know what the word polemics mean? Polemics is the art of debating, the art of arguing. It's where we get our English word politics. And besides lie, what do politicians do? Besides lie, what do politicians do? They debate. They debate usually over. Who can control their territory better? Who can do it over the state? But war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn sore of wits. Yeah. Let's continue. Let's go, let's go back to uh, do the Daniel, Jeremiah. No. Yeah. 
Isaiah chapter 14. Oh. Son of the morning. That is a perfect, beautiful fall. I mean, even Jesus commented on it. I saw Satan what? Fall. I saw Satan fall. Of course. Reality, right? And God called the mystery of, mystery of evil. Mystery. There's evidence to the fact that. Don't understand it? Don't we ever excuse it. Don't ever justify excuse to excuse sin. Because to excuse it is to defend it. And to defend it is to defend the enemy and his cause. God forgives for it. Let's continue. Verse 13. For you have said in your heart, Jesus speaks. So now we're going to find out what was going on in Lucifer's uh, mind. What was his true desires and motives. I, Bert, yeah, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. This rebellion, this war of the throne. Lucifer wanted to be God. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne to the stars of God. Lucifer desired to sit in the position where God is seated on the far, farthest side from basically broke the first commandment when he wanted to be God, and he broke the tenth commandment when he coveted that which does not rightfully belong to him. Right. Namely, worship. Mm. Worship yearns. He craves the worship that rightfully exaltation, self-glorification. I, 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 I. The devil has sinned from the beginning. What's the middle letter? Same condemnation as the devil. What's the middle letter for most? Self. Pride is the root of all and ultimately his fall. And the sad reality is that Satan has deceived the world thinking self is the focus. That's right. And if you don't believe us, let me ask you a question. Have you heard of iPhones, iPods, iPads, iTunes, MySpace? What's that, us and sisters? Now understand. Selfies. Selfies. There you go. Yes. Me teachers are evil because they're not focused here when it needs to be there. And incurable sin of all and most offensive in God's sight. Pride comes before the fall. That's right. Pride comes before a fall. Also in Proverbs chapter 7, this is pride. pride. That's right. Because you see, pride, while it exalts oneself, will eventually only depreciate the sense of others where Jesus would humble himself to save others. Amen. He made in himself to be like his creator. It's the very antithesis, the very opposite of the creator humbling himself to be like his creature. And that's why God will give Jesus the name that is above every name. Hey, praise God. Yeah. You see, Satan, Lucifer, desired God's position, but not his disposition. Jesus, when you are humble. Yeah. Now, question. Did God know all this was going to take place? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Then why did he create Lucifer? Hmm? Why did he create Lucifer, folks? Here. Because love, understand this, love, to be genuine, and true must have the freedom to choose. Must have the freedom to choose. I'm going to take out my iPhone. <laughs> All right? I love you, David. I love you, David. Do I feel better? Yeah. I do? <laughs> and I love you too, honey. <laughs> do I feel better? Absolutely want not. You know why? Because to say, yes, I love you, David, without the freedom to say, no, I don't, is not love but the response of a machine. You understand that? And God will have no mechanical children in his family, folks. Not one. To say yes without the freedom to say no is not love but the response of a machine. And God will have no, zero mechanical children, again, in his family. I mean, think for a moment. For you parents, do you have, did you have, you have children, right? Are you getting yeah. Because you desire to have relations, that's why. And real relationships take real risks. And God took the same risk when he created Lucifer with the freedom to either worship him or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now question. All right? 
Well, we have two reasons for this, brothers and sisters. Nation of God's government is based upon what? Love. Love. So, think about it. If God would have zapped Lucifer with a lightning bolt right from the very beginning, Shabir! Of course! I mean, think about it, huh? You get out of line with God, he's going to squash you like a tomato. Well, God cannot receive worship prompted by fear, but only by love, love of course. I mean, think about it. If you parents, if one of your children misbehaves, do you take them out on the front lawn and say, do you going to happen to you? <laughs> Boom! Let's go enjoy dinner together now. Is that how you win your family over with love? Is that how you win your family with love? No, well, it's no different. It has to have the freedom to choose. And second reason why God didn't destroy Lucifer, which is the big enchilada, is this. And by his grace, we're in a president. All right? We are all his cabinet members. And I invite you over to my house on a Sunday evening because I want to share something with you. So you come over. And during our discussion, wow. I start literally never heard before. I mean, I started to say some, uh, I started to, to speak uh, uh, some nasty words about the president to really defame his character, all right? Things, again, you never, never heard before. First time, first time you heard it. Never heard it, rather. First time you heard it. Totally defamation of character, okay? So we're dismissed and you all go home. And as you're driving home, you're mulling over this up still brewing over everything we just told you, and you're on the way to work. And all Aaron, mysteriously silly killed, single car accident. <laughs> Maybe some of those things I said was what? True. True. Okay, now picture it. Picture it in the context of heaven. Satan raises these accusations that God's not fit to run the universe, and all of a sudden he winds up dead? Well, then every seed he planted in all the other angels' minds would have given validity to his accusations. Amen. Of course. I mean, think about it, folks. Think about it. Absolutely not. So as far as they were concerned, Lucifer was telling them the what? The truth. The truth, of course. And don't forget, folks, Lucifer was God's uh, light bearer. Come out from the get-go would have confirmed every single lie he said. So when we wonder, when we wonder why God is allowing all this evil to continue, it's because of time. Time was needed to find out who was telling the truth, who has the right to rule. If somebody smears my character, how do I defend myself? It takes what? Time. It takes time. You probably said it yourself. Only time will tell. tell. And it took over 4,000 years. And at the cross, it was finally revealed to the onlooking universe that Satan was the father of wow. and the murderer from when? Beginning. The beginning. When he not only sought to dethrone God, but to destroy him. But our redemption, that's the small picture. In the bigger picture, the cross is about the vindication of God's character. Because he's the one on trial. He's the one being falsely accused. Yeah. And that's why Paul could say in Romans chapter 3, you will be found justified when you speak. You will win your case when you are being judged. That's Romans chapter 3. Yeah. And you know what God asked from us during this whole war, this conflict? You know what he asked from us? Last night, Habakkuk, okay? It's a prophet Habakkuk. He's witnessing all kinds of evil injustice in the world. And he's asking God, God, why aren't you doing anything? Pretty much like what we do today. And God says to Habakkuk, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I am doing something, Habakkuk. And if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And Habakkuk says, oh yeah, well try me. And then God says, okay, I'll tell you, but it's going to take some time. But if you are going to be just righteous in my sight, you must live your life by faith. 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 You must trust me. You must trust me, brothers and sisters. So in all ha all right, remember, remember Job and all the havoc that Satan brought upon him? Did Job ever accuse God or defend him? He defended him. Though he slayed me, yet still will I trust him. Well, what are we going to do when, all, when everything is crashing around upon us? You know, brothers and sisters, in Revelation, the angels are folding back the four winds of strife. When those angels release their grip, all hell will literally break loose. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah? A Job's experience? I'm not going to be so brash to say that I am. No way. Peter and the rest of the disciples thought they would too. And they went running with their tail between their legs. You know? I actually heard one time where somebody said, you know what? I don't like the way God uses us as pawns in a chess game with the devil. You know how somebody responded? You know what somebody responded? Somebody said, well, if God could use me as a pawn to checkmate the devil, I'd be honored. Yeah. The book of Job is not for, a, a, for babes, folks. That is for mature Christians. You don't read that to your five or your seven-year-old. All right? 
So, in our lives today, let's take a look. Let's go. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Today. Just to let you know, all the T's, Titus, Thessalonians, and Timothy, are always grouped together. All right? So, if you find one of the T's, it's Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus. But we're going to go to 2 Thessalonians. Now, we want to ask you a question. If Satan walked in here right now and he said, worship me, would we do it? No. Absolutely not. Does, question, does he know that? Yeah. Yeah, he does. So how does Satan receive the worship he desires but doesn't deserve? How does Satan receive the worship he desires but doesn't deserve? Deception. 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 Through deceit, he will receive the worship he desires, and we'll see this momentarily. Some truth with error. That's right. And it's not obvious either. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one walk. Deceive, Deceive you. Yeah. Don't get caught off guard. That's right. You by any means for that day, that's the second coming of Jesus, will not come unless the fallen away comes revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Didn't we read earlier that it was Satan who said, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God? Well, here you have the Antichrist propped up inside the Christian worship as God. You know, many Christians are being said that this is being uh, talked about, a rebuilt Jewish temple. Brothers and sisters, we are the temple of God. This power comes into the church and says, worship me is naos. Naos. And in every single letter of Paul, it's always describing the Christian church. Always. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said, destroy this temple, temple in three days I will raise it up. But he was speaking the temple of his body. body. What's the body? <coughs> Colossians chapter says, okay, when we cover the Antichrist, verse 9, oh boy, of the lawless one, the man of sin, the Antichrist, is according to the working of in it's none, other than, it's none other than the arch deceiver himself. The power of Satan employs the Antichrist with miracle working power to deceive the world into worshiping him. Brothers and sisters, understand, we spoke briefly about it last night. Miracles are not good evidence they come from God. Satan can perform powerful miracles. Satan can perform a good miracle for the purpose of deceiving you. If the ends justify him in his lying faith, you know when they're not being counterfeited. Yes, God is still in the business of doing miracles, but all miracles do not from, come from God. And Jesus said that. And Jesus says, I don't know you. Oh. Mm -hmm. Amen. And these, lie, and these lying wonders, these lying wonders are not obvious. They are deceptive, full of wisdom. Full of wisdom, educated in the courts of heaven. You understand that? What he does, and he blends sublime truths with subtle lies. And this is what gives them such power to careful. I remember one person stood up and said, oh, I'll never be deceived. Oh, really? Adam and Eve, with a perfect nature, was seduced by the lie. What makes you so confident you couldn't be deceived? With a fall in this in a future night, okay? We're just covering, we're just covering basics. Let's go. Revelation 13. Revelation 13. All right. Revelation 1 is in a vision, and he sees lots of symbols and lots of images. Don't focus on those, okay? What we want to focus on, all right, we're going to talk about the symbols and the images later on. Let's pick it up in verse 1. Then the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and we're going to talk about this. A leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, who? Right. Gave him, the beast, his, the Antichrist, his power, his throne, and great authority. Now question, isn't that what Satan wanted for himself? The yep. power, throne, and authority all for himself? Yep. Why would he give it then to the beast, the Antichrist power? Okay. Well, notice very carefully the reversal of roles. Notice very carefully the reversal of roles in verse 3 and 4. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. For, so they, that's the word, Satan, who gave 
And who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? So no, the Antichrist power, so when you worship the beast, who ultimately are you worshiping? Satan, Satan of course. It's the principle of representation. Yeah. Understand, Satan knows that he can't go around seeking worship for himself. So when you worship them, ultimately you're worshiping who? Satan, Satan of course. Well, that begs the question, folks. Who's the beast? The world is worshiping Satan through this power. Come back. You know anybody who knows me, I'd love to tell you right now. I really, really would. But here's the problem. If we did that, you know what would happen? You'd be like this. Really? I, I don't get it. You see, we need to cover more arithmetic. We need more arithmetic. Last night was the basics. Tonight is the common denominator. It's all each piece to the puzzle. Notice with me. So they what? Worship. Worship. Worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they what? Worship. Worship the beast. Verse all who dwell on the earth what is all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? Worship. Worship the first beast. Verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the... Oh, I even said worship the image of the beast. There it is. Yeah. Chapter 14, verse 7, please. 14, 7. The hour of his judgment has come... And, uh, oh, worship. and what? Worship. Worship. worship him who made heaven and earth the scene of springs of water. Verse 9. No, then no. a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone what? Worship. Worship. Worships the beast. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest there at night. Who what? Who worship. worship the beast. So notice, eight times in these two short chapters, worship is the central theme. This is what the con this is what the war, the cosmic command, heaven and earth, the scene of springs of water, or the beast representing Satan, is about power. It is not. And worlds suddenly appear, folks. It's all about worship, folks. And in the last days, Satan's going to use his pride and joy, the Antichrist, the beast, along with his mark, to receive worship for himself. And though we haven't discovered exactly how that happened, how that how that will take place, we will. We will, folks, okay? We're going to discover exactly how it takes place. We're just adding another piece. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4. Because in Matthew chapter 4, nowhere is it more evident of Satan's desire found for worship there. And we read it last night, but we're going to read it again. Matthew chapter 4. You keep coming back, brothers and sisters, okay? we just got to lay down the foundation. We spoke about that last night. We're just adding a piece to the puzzle. That's all we're doing. Be patient, okay? Be patient. You'll see it all too clear. All too clear in God's word. Matthew chapter 4. Okay, let's pick it up in verse 8. Again, the devil took him up in an exceedingly high mountain. There he goes again. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. If you will fall down and walk. Worship. <laughs> asking his own creator on your knees and worship me. <laughs> It epitomizes from the get-go what Satan desired when he wanted to see, receive worship for himself and be like God. And in the last days, Satan's going to bring this crisis of worship, folks. Either the creator or the creature. It's not just going to church. Worship is a way of life. Amen. It's a contraction of two words. Worth. What is, worth the, what, is, uh, what is worth the most to you is what you will think. People, pleasure, food, money, life of ease, sports, technology, fashion. Yeah. Jesus, the first commandment is, thou shalt have who or what is. Let's continue. So, yeah, let's continue. Be sober. Be, vig be vigilant. Why? Because your family, Satan is playing for keeps. And he will use any, any device in order for us to become his prey. You understand that? He would love nothing better than to sedate us with drugs and alcohol. Or hypnotize us with mindless, mindless hours of TV watching. You know, understand folks, very important, okay? The mind is where this battle is our thoughts through our senses. And that black top, whether it's sitting on your lap or in your living room wall, is one of his great... The reason why the world is in the condition that it's in 
is because it's true. Life does imitate art. And this so-called art on coming down society, you better believe it, folks. We no longer think for ourselves. Said, don't worry about what people think. They've stopped doing that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And that's why Peter says, listen, pay attention. Stay awake. Be ready, folks. But most of us would just love to bury our heads in our gadgets and our gizmos, folks. You know? It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. Satan is determined to have our minds absorbed in the things of the world rather than the word. Protect ourselves then. How do we protect ourselves, folks? Put on the whole armor of man. Man. Oh, I'm sorry, God. God, yes, put on the armor of God. For our struggle is not fle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Only God's armor, not man's armor. You understand that, folks? Don't kid yourself if you think you're going to beat. That's going to help you, because it will not. All right? Worldly weapons and worldly attire is completely useless in a spiritual battle. Completely useless in a spiritual battle. I'm going to share with you a brief testimony of mine, okay? Years ago, I used to take martial arts, okay? Full contact, all right? When it came to putting on the gloves, I was pretty good at it, all right? Ten years in the ring. When I to myself, I used to actually not even think to myself, I used to tell my friends, the devil? Bring him on. Come on. I'll go a couple rounds. You want to dance with them? I'll, I'll dance with them. Not a problem. It's true. I was pretty proud until one day Jesus let down that protective hedge around me. Amen. And I found myself on my knees. I was demonically attacked. I was demonically attacked and I was on my knees sobbing uncontrollably like a little baby, folks. I had to call my pastor 3 o'clock in the morning and seek some prayer for, uh, by him. Forces and demonic powers are not some sci-fi movie from Hollywood. They are involved in a cosmic conflict between the four. On the armor, can we be safe? That's all the armor. All of it. Don't think, folks, if you just put the helmet on, you're okay. Can not we? Into the whole armor. Yes. And you notice, out of all the armor, what's the only weapon? Sword. Sword. The word. The sword. The sword of the spirit, which is what? Word. Word. word of God. The word of God. God. Our only line of defense against Satan's deceptions is God's word. <coughs> Question. How sharp is your sword? How sharp is your And they were in the field one day taking down some trees. Now Jack chopped wood continuously. He never, never took a break, okay? Carl, on the other, other hand, would take a break every hour on the hour. Well, at the end of the day, Jack noticed Carl actually chopped more wood than he did. And he was somewhat confused because he saw Carl taking a break every hour, where he never took a break. So he approached Carl, and he said, Carl, how's it? Carl shrugged their shoulders and said, I don't know. Well, I was taking my break. I was sharpening my blade. Mm. Mm. Amen. There's a lot of truth to it, brothers and sisters, because here's the thing. How effective can we be against the cleverly misleading lies of the enemy with a dull sword? Understand, folks, Satan and his minions are sharpening their arguments. Twitters. Well, what are we going to do in our downtime, folks? What are we doing in our time down? What are we doing in our downtime? Got our faces, we, is it, we're spending our time in Facebook? Shouldn't we, our, face, our faces be in the book? Yep. <laughs> Mindless hours on Facebook. Folks, we need to get in our faces in the book. You know, Dwight Moody one time said, you know, it's true, folks. You know, you can choose your scripture or you can choose your clicker. Choose your weapon. Choose your weapon. All right. This brings us to the end of evil. The end of evil. It's called the Eden to Eden perspective or Eden to Eden restored, Okay. God and his children joyfully in God's word. In Revelation, you have God and his children in a, a reu reunited in a world flawlessly recreated. Third chapter in Genesis, you have the first battle between Christ and Satan. Third to the last chapter in Revelation, you have the between the over one heart of deeds to do over our lives. 
right here to Acts chapter 26, please. We're going to conclude right here, folks, okay? Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. We will conclude right here, folks. You know, a lot of times we read God's word. Let's look at it in the bigger... Acts chapter 26. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Verse 12. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, brighter than the sun, shining around me, and those who journeyed with me. Verse 14. And when we had all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, and saying, to, and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you per conscience was hurting? So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand. What purpose? To make you a minister and a witness and reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send. Why? To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Jesus appeared to Paul for a purpose. And brothers and sisters, Jesus has a purpose for you. Jesus has a purpose for you. Don't think your life has no meaning because it most certainly does. You can be a soldier for Christ. I mean, think, if Jesus can use, can enlist Jonah who ran from him, all right, or Samson who was self-centered, or Ray in a dry fleece, he can use you. He can use you, brothers and sisters. And if, you, and if there's any area in your life that you want to turn over from darkness to light, you can. It's actually more simple than you think. The power of choice. The power of choice. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. serve. Two powers. Two powers. Two masters. Two roads. And anyone who refuses to surrender to one, po to one power, by default, would find themselves serving the other. There's just no other alternative. Who will we surrender them to, folks? Who will we surrender them to? And folks, we know who wins. We know who wins. If your ballot is for him, then bow your heads with me, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Amen. Our gracious Father, and to look behind the scenes, to have a, a little bit better understanding of what's really going on behind, the, behind them. And as we leave this evening, Lord, may we take the time to go over what we've heard and to cement it in our mind that the enemy is real and he is seeking worship for himself. May we search our lives to be that be sure that we've surrendered every aspect over the, to you for you are worthy for worship do bring us back safely get us home safely and do bring us back home uh, to